Hello everyone, this is What's Your Pastor and tell you today I have Dr. Zachary Arden. We're going to be talking about the conversation that Stephen Meyer had with Joe Rogan. And they said a lot of really interesting stuff, so we want to talk about it. Uh, Dr. Arden has some particular thoughts considering he's a scientist, and uh, I just wanted to get some um, clarification on a lot of things so he can, he can give some clarity and help us uh, see what went on in this conversation. So how are you doing today, Dr. Arden? Yes, thanks, Zach. It's, it's great to be here. I love your podcast and uh, excited to talk about some science. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so uh, just for everyone's you know curiosity, give us just a quick two second uh, talk about your background. Most people are probably already familiar with you. Uh, yes, I, I did an interview uh, with Zach a, a while ago, so people can check that out for more. But um, I'm an evolutionary biologist currently based in Cambridge in the UK, uh, originally from New Zealand, and uh, for the last few years was working in Germany. Fun, fun, fun. All right. So, uh, yeah, so you're going to have some particular expertise on this topic of science and evolution and stuff. And uh, I think that'll be really helpful for the, the people that aren't as familiar with the science. So, yeah, um, let's just talk about just our, you know, general first thoughts after watching it and then we can dive into specifics so uh yeah i mean what were your first thoughts after listening to it yeah the, the, it covers a, a, a massive and, and crazy amount of um territory in terms of the, the topics covered so um overall I, I think stephen meyer did a did a good job as an apologist um i'm a christian i agree with him on kind of a lot of what he said um from the kind of philosophy angle and i'm, I'm sympathetic with the stuff he says on things I don't know that much about, like the fine tuning and cosmology, but I'm not an expert there and, and, and don't claim to be. Um, but I guess on the science side, I, I would have some disagreements and, and keen to talk through why why that is and, and why I think he didn't really present the science uh, in a way that I'd see as accurate. Hmm. And okay. I guess my kind of purpose in doing this conversation is to kind of throw a different um, expert opinion in there because I think it's important for Christian apologists to kind of have have feedback and, and for them to be public critique um, of the kind of the details that they're presenting. Hmm. Interesting. Very good stuff. Okay. So, yeah, my first thoughts were I was very surprised on just the amount of different arguments for Christianity that Dr. Meyer was able to give. It was a three hour long conversation, but even then, like on a, on a secular you know, a mainly secular podcast like Joe Rogan's that reaches millions of people. Like it was really cool to hear, uh, you know, just general arguments for Christianity on there. And um, I'm sure that's been really helpful for a lot of people. The, the I, I don't have, I mean, there were a couple arguments that I'm, I'm not terribly a fan of, but for the most part, like he gave all the, the pretty good ones and he did a good job presenting them. Rogan didn't have like that much to say because he's not really an expert in philosophy or anything like that. Um, he, you know, he had some interesting questions, and, but um, you know, there was some biblical stuff that might be interesting and maybe worth talking about. I'm interested to see what you have on the science, um, but overall, I was very impressed, and um, I, I, I did enjoy the interview with with uh, you know Stephen Meyer a lot. So. Uh, kudos to him and, you know, good job getting on there and reaching a lot of people. So that's awesome. So, yeah, let's let's dig into it. So, you know, I mean, for the most part, there really wasn't that much science talk out there. Like, you know, there was some types of like, you know, cosmology in regards to fine tuning and the the clum, uh, like in the beginning of the universe. Uh, but, you know, that's not really Dr. Arden's speciality. So we're not going to really con comment on that much. And it's certainly not mine. Um, but specifically on like the biology evolution side, um, I think this will be really interesting to talk about. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, that's kind of that, a good end to that section. So the, I, I something I really wanted to bring up is, you know, a lot of people are going to struggle with the idea of like, Hey, this guy's an evolutionist and he's, you know, that that's like going to be a conflict because like, Hey, you know, evolution can't be true if Christianity is true. Um, could you just really quickly give some, like, why are you okay with being an evolutionist while also being a Christian? Yeah, so I, I think God uses natural laws in, in all kinds of ways. 
Um, a lot of people who are creationists of some kind, maybe old earth creationists, they're okay with God using natural laws to make the solar system, for instance. And there's this kind of physical models of that. Or you can, you can, you know, astrophysicists can see some aspects of galaxy formation or um, so we can understand this stuff. We can model it. And not many Christians have a problem with, with that kind of thing. Even actually some young earth creationist models actually involve um, intrinsically involve there being real physical models of things like galaxy formation. So God can use natural laws to create things that look yeah. beautiful and, and that kind of thing. And I, I would say, I, I think we can at least conceivably extend that to biological life as well. Um, I think um, the physical laws need to be fine-tuned to create a life permitting universe and maybe need to be additionally fine-tuned to create something as amazing as, as Earth and our solar system. Um, and I think biological laws maybe also need to be fine-tuned for for evolution to work. Uh, whatever those processes are, I, I think you know the rational creator God, who's created the whole universe, uh, could also create those uh, law-like processes that were involved in kind of the unfolding of, of life, analogously to how he's made law-like processes in the kind of unfolding complexity of the physical universe, like galaxies and solar systems. So yeah, that's my kind of big picture view of, of how I think God is um, related to the large scale history of the universe. Yeah, and yeah. in regards to a biblical idea of that and how that contradicts, uh, just really quickly, you know, that could be a 10 hour conversation. But um, yeah, I mean, I'd say like myself, you know, I've interviewed 100 different scholars on the topic. Um, there's a lot of different other views out there than just like some super literal young earth creationist view. And I'd say that, you know, a lot of the traditional ways of like saying, oh, like you don't trust Jesus or whatever, uh, just aren't very good arguments. And I think there's uh, better arguments out there that don't uh, that allow for a someone to be an evolutionist and also believe in the Bible and believe that it's inerrant. Any thoughts you want to add to that? No, just people should listen to all your other uh, interviews that you have literally hundreds of hours of of interviewing these, these different scholars on on related related topics and so yeah there's there's a bunch of different views there it's it's way too much to summarize but um i would say pers um you know i'm not a biblical scholar but just as i read the text and, and read commentaries on the text and, and learn what christians through time have, mm -hmm. have have thought about the text i've just become much more relaxed about um seeing that th there's a lot of room here and it, it's it's not doing the kind of straightforward history that um, I might have assumed uh, initially it was just coming at it with a scientific view. Um, actually, what the writer was trying to do is quite different, um, leaves a lot of space for, for how we interpret that. And I, I think the big picture of God creating and bringing order um, out of chaos and um, bringing order to the universe, I, I think that's the main kind of thing I would want to take away from the first chapter of Genesis. Hmm. Uh, yeah, let's dive into it. Evolution. To the world. Do you, do you believe in evolution? I believe in, uh, well, that, that's a, I believe in micro evolution. I believe that there are real evolutionary processes. I'm skeptical about what's called universal common descent, the idea that all living forms have evolved from one single common ancestor. I'm profoundly skeptical, uh, skeptical about ch chemical evolution, the idea that the, um, non-living chemicals in a prebiotic ocean or prebiotic soup arrange themselves to form the first living cell. And I'm also skeptical about the creative power of the mutation selection mechanism, which as it happens, uh, so are many leading evolutionary biologists today. I attended a conference in 2016 at the Royal, convened by the Royal Society uh, in London, uh, Royal Society being the oldest and most august scientist. Uh, quick comment there. Uh, he mentioned chemical evolution, basically like just a biogenesis. I've never really heard it portrayed as like that. I mean, do you, do you think that's an appropriate way to describe evolution or is he just using it in a different way? Yeah, so it'd be unusual, I think, for biologists to call that evolution, just because when biologists think about evolution, it is the diversification of life after whatever the origin was. Uh, so Darwin kind of talked about it in, in a similar way. and and biologists since then have done so that they, there's kind of a sharp distinction there between origin of life um, and, and biological evolution. So I, I think you can call it chemical evolution and mm -hmm. when people do, it's just unusual to see them kind of uh, 
put together and that they're, they're just very different disciplines. Mm. Um, and I think there's a kind of rhetorical reason for doing that. But if you kind of can cast doubt on chemical evolution, that um, the hope might be that that kind of transfers over a bit to biological evolution. But mm. um, I, I think it's, and I, I, you know, you could go either way on that. I can see why people would say that's legitimate. Um, I just think it's um, kind of cleaner or tidier to keep them as, mm. as separate uh, questions because they're, they're just dealing with quite different issues, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you hear all the time that like a biogenesis has its issues or, you know, we don't know everything. So I, I see how if you if you call it evolution, then it's like, well, you know, you could say, oh, we don't have proof for that. And therefore, you know, that's evidence against evolution or something like that. I can see that, you know, of course, we don't know if Meyer is making that argument or, you know, and that people in his culture are just calling it that. So, you know, that's not necessarily a knock on him. And he didn't specifically describe that. So, uh, but, you know, that's very helpful. Interesting. Let me know if it, it was con convened by a group of evolutionary biologists who were essentially dissatisfied with neo-Darwinism, the standard textbook theory that we learn in um, in all high school and college textbooks. And, and many of them were saying we need a new theory of evolution. The first talk at that conference was given by Gerd Müller, a prominent Austrian evolutionary biologist, and he simply enumerated the five major uh, what he called explanatory deficits of neo-Darwinism. And his basic perspective was the mutation selection mechanism does a good job of, of uh, optimizing or modifying pre-existing forms. Um, it can generate small-scale variation, but it does a very poor job of explaining the origin of those forms. Think about, for example, the Dar Darwin's finch beaks. Great job of explaining how variations in weather patterns result in changes in the shape and structure of the finch beaks. But that mechanism turns out not to do a good job of explaining the origin of birds or ma other ma major animal groups in the first place. So uh, modification, yes, innovation, no. But so modification it, over massive amounts of time, don't you think that would eventually lead to new groups? Because a lot of new groups have, they have similar origins, or at least origins from uh, one ancestor. Well, time, like primates. Was, yeah, time was always the hero of the plot. But l let, me, the, there couple, let me just run okay. a, a couple of arguments by you and let's see, see okay. what you think, okay? And I, I developed these in a lot of detail in my book, Darwin's Doubt. Um, uh, if we, we, uh, we now know, thanks to the genetic revolution, the, the molecular biological revolution, that if you want to build a new form of life, you have at least ha you have to have new code because all, all new forms of life depend upon uh, new anatomical, a fundamentally new type, uh, type of animal, for example. Um, so you need new anatomical structures, from, but the new anatomical structures require new cell types New types. So, if you got animals that first come on the line have, and they have they have a digestive system, they have a gut. Well, you got to have enzymes that can service a gut that can process food. So, enzymes are types of proteins. Proteins are built from the informational code in DNA. So, anytime you want to get a new, it's just like in the computer world. If you want to give your computer a new function, you've got to provide new code. So, um, we have these long string, these long digital bit strings. Uh, a, C's, G's, and T's, not zeros and ones, but A, C's, G's, and T's in a, in a, in a, in a digital string. And we call that a gene. And if you have a, a section of DNA for building a protein, that's great, it all works. Now, but if you want to build a fundamentally new form of life, you've got to have, you got to have new proteins to service the new cell types to build the new anatomical structures. Um, in our computer world, we know that if you start randomly changing the... All right, so what do you got? Yeah, so he, he said a bunch of stuff there, but I, I just wanted to, to focus in on a, a couple of things. Um, yeah. So I think Rogan asked a couple of really good questions there. Um, do you believe in evolution? A good place to start, because <laughs> um, maybe what, what Steve's views are not actually that clear, and, and there's a good reason for that, in that people who believe in intelligent design or promote uh, that kind of thing actually have a range of different views on this kind of question. So for someone coming from completely outside, it's you know entirely legitimate to ask, what are you, what are you saying about evolution here? So I think that's a good question. Um, and what Steve uh, Meyer says is pretty interesting. I believe in microevolution, 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm skeptical about what called what's called universal common descent. So those are kind of like two ends of the spectrum, like microevolution, really small change, universal common descent, the biggest possible claim you could make about um, evolution in a way in terms of in terms of descent. Um, so so that, that's interesting that he, he's he's saying, okay, I believe in the really small stuff and I reject the really big stuff. But that leaves, for me, that's interesting and that it leaves such a lot of ground in the middle. Like where he's not really putting himself down at all in, in that statement, other than saying he rejects the complete evolutionary story. <laughs> yeah. that, that, is, that is something. Um, he, he's not a full-blown evolutionist, but that's not surprising to anyone who, who knows um, much at all about what, what he thinks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So I, I think a bit later on, um, there's another clip where we'll, we'll go into that in a bit more detail. But uh, Rogan asks an, another question, or it kind of makes a, a comment that a lot of new groups have similar origins, or at least origins from one ancestor, like primates. And I, I think that is getting at something really important that someone like Steve Meyer should address, um, that primates do seem to be related to each other. And there seems to be like different groups of primates and kind of like this hierarchical structure. Um, we've got primates as like a big group, and then apes as a smaller group, and then um, maybe like hominids or something like that as, as a smaller group within that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, the pattern that evolution is trying to explain. And, and, and that's what ideally as a biologist, I want to hear more about from someone like Stephen Meyer. Why is there this kind of pattern in um, nature? And I, I don't think he really um, has much to say on that, um, other than being skeptical about some of the processes involved. Hmm. Mm, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I know that like someone like Answers of Genesis is like, you know, super way like, I don't, I don't know the exact technical words they use, but like they're like no evolution at all. But then like some young earth creationist organizations are like way over to the right. Of course, you know, Stephen Meyer is an older earth, old earth creationist. So, you know, maybe he's a little more in the middle than everyone else is. But oftentimes they'll use the same, you know, microevolution word. So, yeah, I can see how that's really vague. Um, yeah, and I, I, I imagine that's um, somewhat intentional that a, lo a lot of supporters of intelligent design are young with creationists or mm. have, have a view all across the spectrum. And yeah. uh, it's interesting, at least, that people like Stephen Meyer really don't pin themselves down as to what, what they're saying, other than being skeptical of evolution, which a, a lot of um, kind of creationists of different kind will will be sympathetic to. Um, mm, yeah, yeah, so that, that's interesting. I, I think Joe's asking the right kind of questions here. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. You know, say the view that everyone agrees on, you know, except for the evolutionists. <laughs> that's interesting. All right. Um, also, uh, so he did talk about this idea of like a conference that he went to and people are skeptical of Darwinism or neo-Darwinism Darwinism and it has some, you know, issues or whatever. Um, so like, I mean, I've heard this from young earth creationist organizations and, you know, people love to throw out the word Darwinism and neo-Darwinism. And I know that like, I've, I've talked to some evolutionary uh, biologists and philosophers that this word Darwinism is often used in the literature to mean like, you know, what evolutionists believe today. But at the same time, obviously that's a lot different than like, Lamarckian evolution or what, you know, Darwin actually believed back then. So I, I guess there wasn't necessarily a, a clear way Darwinism was defined in this, in this little talk here, but, you know, neo Darwin, Darwinism has a specific definition, right? So long story short, um, I mean, are you familiar with this idea that people are rejecting Darwinism and neo Darwinism? Yeah, these these terms are really contentious, and there's lots of different camps that will kind of defend their terms, and 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 um, <laughs> so it, it's pretty complicated, and there's like a, a long history to this as well, and people okay. disagree about the history as well. That's what makes it so 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 kind of messy. But oh. there is a, a kind of a, a stricter sense of of neo Darwinism, um, which may or may not be historically accurate, but l let's say that that is a concept at least that people can can see as, as a stricter sense that it is mm -hmm. um, completely random mutation and uh, therefore the only kind of uh, interesting creative force is is natural selection. Um, so that's one kind of quite extreme view and it's mm -hmm. kind of quite easy to to oppose that and that there's 
that's not the mainstream of evolutionary theory anymore, that there's a lot of complexity in evolutionary theory, lots of different forced, um, kind of factors called the extended um, evolutionary synthesis, which is, pulls together a whole, whole bunch of different processes that operate at different levels mm -hmm. uh, in evolution, and it's, it's different in different organisms. How bacteria and viruses are evolving is, is different to how um, complex animals and um, humans and, and, and others are evolving. So yeah, there's this whole bunch of, of processes. So it's quite easy to um, critique a very strict form of, of neo-Darwinism, but that's not so interesting and that that's really not where the cutting edge of evolution biology is. Hmm. There's a lot of interesting biology that can be talked about there, but it doesn't really, I think it's kind of a distraction. It doesn't directly uh, help the kind of case that Stephen Meyer, I think, wants, wants to make it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if Meyer is doing this on purpose or this is his understanding of like where the scientific world is right now. But like, you know, every once in a while, I'll talk to people like Joel Duff and other, you know, you know, like YouTube biologists, stuff like that. And it's like it's my understanding that like there's, you know, there there are definitely people that have rejected, you know, as you say, like the strict view of neo Darwinism, but you know, they have all these all these additional views or, you know, more complicated ones that explain that are meant to explain the issues that neo Darwinism had, you know, as we've uncovered more issues. So like Meyer's saying, hey, you know, there's a lot of people rejecting it, but I'm like, I don't. I'm not familiar with this. These people that are rejecting evolution as a whole. Yeah, definitely neo Darwinism in general. Um, so like, you know, maybe he's not doing it on purpose. Where he's like, it's like seems like he's it like to the to the uneducated person to me like it seems like he's saying, hey, you know, evolution is is being rejected. It's actually a surprise. Like, there's actually a bunch of scientists that are rejecting it, but, you know. He, it seems like he's using two different words for evolution of how mainstream scientists see it compared to how he's using the word neo-Darwinism. Would you agree with all that I said there? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And I, I just as you are saying that, I was thinking, I think you could do something like this in kind of any scientific field where there's still some unanswered questions and there's still some debates. Right. You could kind of hone in on one of those debates and go, look, these guys are rejecting this particular version of this theory. And you could kind of blow that up and make it look like that's, kind of it, you know, putting the whole field at risk. But usually that's not the case. There's there's always kind of ongoing debates about the details. Um, mm -hmm. But the important thing for me is that the big picture is actually really solid. Like there's actually good reasons why Darwin and people at the time of Darwin were persuaded that he had, he had something here. And there's a bunch more evidence that's accumulated since then that hasn't actually overturned the, the big picture. And I think it's just really convenient to focus on some of the details and zoom in on those and kind of ignore the big picture, which which I, I don't think is a helpful thing. I think we need to explain that big picture as well as the details. And that's what evolution biologists are trying to do. Well, I mean, don't you see an issue with with like, I mean, think about it this way. So if if I gave you a Bible verse and you were like, hey, you know, that agrees with these five other verses, but it disagrees with this up uh, this sixth verse. And most people would say, okay, you know, that that doesn't work. Like we have to say, you know, that that's not a coherent view. It doesn't explain all the details. But I, I, I think that if like if Meyer, just, Meyer were to say, hey, you know, it, the, the, we still have some unanswered questions. Maybe this whole evolution thing isn't what we thought it was. Do you do you sympathize with that argument at all? Yeah, I think you can make that argument in any scientific field. And it's just it's just going to be the preponderance of evidence or something like that. It's going to be like, maybe that's a phrase Joe Rogan even used, uses later, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, it, it's about like, what's the best explanation that we have? What is the big picture suggesting? And um, is there kind of real weightiness to this view of the world, to this theory? Or is it fundamentally flawed? And I, I just don't, I'm just really not seeing the case that it's fundamentally flawed. And he, he gives a couple of arguments that, that we'll go into. And I, I think they just basically don't work. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so there's lots of interesting biological questions, but um, I'm yeah not persuaded that he's kind of presenting an alternative approach that's more kind of fruitful scientifically uh, for those questions. 
Yeah. So basically what you're saying is like, you know, you could poke holes in one specific view, but it's still the best view compared to, you know, another option that you might have a hundred other issues. And yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's true with, with any scientific theory, there'll always be some data that doesn't seem to fit perfectly. <laughs> um, but, but I'm not actually granting that much to him. I, I don't think his arguments here are very good anyway. Oh. Um, but so we'll go into the, the details of it. I don't think he's really poking mm -hmm. holes, but e even if he were, that wouldn't undermine the, the large scale kind of mm -hmm. evidence that we have for some kind of evolutionary process that mm -hmm. we still have the fossil record, which does show this apparent development. It does show the, these chains of succession where things seem to be related to stuff that was different, but preceded them in time. Mm -hmm. And we can kind of see that spreading throughout geological history. That, that's one big piece of evidence. Another is by geography, how animals and plants and things are distributed over the globe and through time and how that looks also like this kind of branching evolutionary process. And the other one is like genetic, or one other one is like genetic data is how things seem to be related in their genomes also fits this kind of branching evolutionary process. So th there's all these kind of large scale um, evidences that are pointing towards some kind of evolutionary process. And, and um, pointing out a couple of details doesn't really undermine that, uh, even if the, the arguments he made here work, which uh, we'll come on to soon. I, I don't think they do. <laughs> okay. The zeros and ones in a section of genetic, in a section of digital code, you're going to degrade the function of that code long before you come up with a new string for making a new program or operating system that the, the functional sequences are what are, they're called, they're highly isolated in what's called sequence space. You, you, you can change a few things and still retain function, but after ver a very few number of changes, you're gonna degrade the function and long before you come up with a new function. Now the Darwinian mechanism um, starts with the idea that there are random changes in those, uh, in those digital bit strings, those sequences of A's, C's, G's, and T's. And based on our experience in the computer world, we would expect that random changes are going to, again, degrade those strings long before they're capable of building a new protein. And there's now very compelling experimental evidence that that's true. There's an Israeli um, molecular biologist, Dan Tofik. Unfortunately, he died fairly recently in a tragic accident. But he was doing uh, mutagenesis experiments on sequences of the, uh, on sequences of code for building specific proteins that fold it into stable structures. Called, they're actually called protein folds. And he found that between three and 15 mutations was enough uh, to degrade the thermodynamic stability of the protein structure that, that the, 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 the gene was making. And once you lose that thermodynamic stability, you, there's no, you, you have no pr uh, functional possibilities. Is there possibly an undiscovered mechanism for protecting against that that we're not aware of yet? Possibly, but there's n numerous lines of evidence suggesting that you, that mutations are are within limits. They're going. You can modify again. You can optimize a, an existing protein structure called a fold. But if you t if you allow too many of those mutations, you're going to degrade. And long before you would get a fundamentally new protein structure, an, another protein fold. So that's that's just one of many. I want to. Did you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Sorry. Sorry. Go for it. Yeah. So this is um, probably the closest to the kind of research that I do. So I'm, I'm really interested in this question. I've been thinking about it for quite a few years. Um, and I think it is asking some really interesting questions about how do new genes arise, how do new proteins arise. A um, couple of quotes that I pulled out, he said, after a very few number of changes, you're gonna degrade the function. Uh, between three and 15 mutations was enough to degrade the thermodynamic stability of the protein structure. So this, this was some experimental results that he's referring to, um, but I think just, just citing these numbers by itself just isn't relevant to evolution. Um, evolution isn't just throwing a whole bunch of random mutations uh, at, at a protein and and nothing else happening. Mm -hmm. um, proteins are sensitive to random mutations, but then 
evolution is this process of filtering the random mutations by natural selection. So it doesn't throw like a hundred mutations at a protein and watch it collapse. It, it's it's the slow process of slowly mutating proteins and only the ones that are passing through the, some kind of filter of natural selection are being passed on to future generations. Um, so I, I had a slide um, or two kind of illustrating um, a couple of those points I, I think is is useful. I got you. Is this there a previous one? There's this one. Yeah, this yeah, this one. is the one to start with. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay, so so this is um, showing a protein that a lot of us are pretty familiar with, or have at least vaguely heard of um, on the news, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus that causes COVID. And over the last kind of um, three years now, we've, we've seen this uh, protein being mutated lots. So there was an original virus, um, which uh, started in Wuhan in China, and we know this, the sequence of that virus, and we know the sequence of the current virus, the Omicron strain. Um, and even when the strain, so the current virus actually has even more mutations, but when the strain originated, um, it had 37 mutations mm -hmm. um, in uh, this particular protein uh, as compared to the, the original ones. So even just over the last three years, it's, a, it's, it's evolved a lot. Um, the magic numbers that, that Stephen Meyer was talking about were between three and 15 mutations. He said the protein, basically what he's saying is the protein basically collapses after that number. Well, that, that's not true in this case, um, 37 mutations, which shows you can have a lot of mutations and the protein won't collapse, um, at least if it's gone through the filter of natural selection. And that's kind of the whole point of the evolutionary process. It's not just kind of randomly shooting mutations, lots of them at a time at, at proteins, it's mutation plus the filter of natural selection. Um, so yeah, the, that's just to say that these numbers that he's pulling out I don't think they're relevant to the evolutionary process. Empirically, we can see that because even the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, even this a single domain, the receptor binding domain, that has that received at least 15 mutations in the Omicron variant over the last three years. And it hasn't, it still functions. It actually functions in some ways probably better than it did before. Um, so yeah, this this kind of attempt at an argument about thermodynamic stability of proteins doesn't seem to work just in light of the very well-known case of the, the spike protein that's evolved just over the last three years. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's fairly uh, devastating to at least the way that Stephen Meyer seems to want to kind of phrase it in this way. Maybe he's simplifying, maybe there's a more nuanced form of that. Hmm. Um, I, I've heard various things related to this. I, I, I don't think they're very persuasive because we do see um, a lot of evolution happening, even within the kind of groups of evolution that the, the extent of evolution that groups like um, Answers and Genesis would accept. That if you compare the the sequences, you know, between a house cat and a lion, or between a you know a dog and a wolf, or a dog and a fox, that all of these creationist groups will will accept are related to each other. There's a lot of evolution that's happened there. You can count the changes in the proteins. Um, they're, they're often above this kind of this limit that Stephen Meyer wants to accept. So I, I don't think it works empirically. Hmm. So just for some clarity, so you're basically yeah. saying that Meyer is arguing that if you get to a certain level of changes, mutations, that the protein's going to break apart, and you're saying, well, hey, what about this? I mean, this is obvious an example where yeah. you know it doesn't break apart like that, and it changes, and it you know still survives and maybe even better or whatever. Um, so, um, you know, that's obviously, that seems to me at least very different than saying, hey, you know, cats and lions and whatever else are evolution, you know, like, like evolution, evolution, not just microevolution. Do you see what I'm getting at? Um, so the point is, just to clarify what I was trying to say with the, say the cats and the lions is that they also have proteins that also would have changed and you okay. can compare their sequences. And I, I haven't done this. Um, we actually did it a, a few years ago and I'm trying to remember the, the numbers, but I, I haven't done it for individual proteins like this, but I'm sure there's, there's many changes between these proteins. Um, when you consider some of these, the large amounts of evolution that even Answers in Genesis. So it's, it would be very surprising if Stephen Meyer is more conservative than Answers in Genesis, <laughs> right? Yeah. 
um, on, on that kind of question of how much evolution is allowed, particularly given the answers in Genesis has an incredibly restricted time span to allow evolution. Stephen Meyer doesn't have that. He's not a young earth um, creationist. So, so he doesn't have that restricted time span. So there's, you know, this is why Stephen Meyer says, I accept microevolutionary processes earlier on. The problem is just when you really press into that, like, what are you saying? What, how much evolution are you accepting? When you actually looked at, look at the genome sequences of even like a cat and a lion or a, a dog and a fox, that pretty much all creationists will say are related to each other. There's a lot of sequence evolution. There's a lot of protein evolution that happens there, which seems to undermine some of these kind of protein arguments. Um, at least this first very, actually quite a strong, quite a strict protein argument he's trying to make with this first one. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, this slide. Yeah. So this one's a bit more complicated. Um, but He's trying to make the argument that pro he says that proteins are isolated in sequence space, that protein folds are isolated, that in other words, you can't get from one fold to another fold, that um, because these protein folds have these kind of distinct shapes, and in order to get to another shape, there's just way too many changes, um, and you, you can't get that many changes because of these magic numbers that he was trying to present of between 3 and 15, the protein collapses. So. Hopefully, intuitively, that kind of argument makes sense. That if if it takes too many changes to get from one fold to another, and by doing that you inherently collapse the fold, it's just not going to work, right? Um, so that's the argument he's trying to make. Th there's a few issues with that, but one of the issues is that empirically, uh, we we can show pretty persuasively that that's not the case. That these things are not all isolated from each other. There are some that are actually very similar. They're different folds, but in terms of the sequence changes you need to get from one fold to the other are not actually that profound. And you can actually trace back the most likely step by which that happened. Um, so it's, it's he, he's trying to extrapolate from some cases that, that have been studied where some folds do seem to be relatively isolated to this general claim that all folds are super isolated. And that's just not true uh, as an empirical statement. And, and this is an example of um, uh, two folds. One's a helix turn helix fold, the other's a winged helix. These are just both um, major protein folds that um, a bunch of proteins have. And this paper is arguing that, that actually they fairly clearly seem to be related to each other um, through this evolutionary process um, that they've uh, kind of mapped out. So just for clarification, basically you're yeah. saying it that these protein folds are similar, maybe even related, so that even though there are their changes, they're still going to work together really well. And yeah, it's, it's you, not you just can, like this blind chance kind of thing. Yeah, so you, you can fairly well trace out the probable kind of pathway that would have happened to get from one to the other, um, which wouldn't be plausible if they were completely isolated and massively different in their sequence. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, the, the general claim that they're massively isolated just is, is, is not true, at least for many protein folds. Um, th th there's, there's other biological details. Some of my research is, is related to that, that actually there isn't there are origins of new protein folds as well. Uh, it's, it's not just that every protein is related to another protein and kind of evolving from one to the other, but you can actually originate new folds. And there's a lot of recent research on that. And, and some of my research is, is um, in that area. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting biology there, but some of the basic claims he's kind of assuming mm -hmm. are, are just not true biologically, I, I would argue. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the next clip. All right. Run one other argument by you that I think is very intuitive. Um, the, if you want to build, uh, it turns out that there are, are um, th there are structures or systems for building that are uh, very important for building new animal body plants, and they're called developmental gene regular regulatory networks. They were they were discovered at Caltech uh, by Eric Davidson and colleagues. Eric Davidson has also unfortunately recently passed away in the last few years. But what these are, what, what they discovered is that you not only have genes for building proteins, you have genes that are building uh, that for for 
constructing molecules that send signals that tell the genome when to express other parts of itself. So you've got si there's signaling molecules that are telling the genome when, when to turn this part or that part on in order to build the right proteins at the right time as new cells are going through cell division in the process of animal development. So if you go from one cell to two to four to eight to 16, et cetera, you've got to, and as, so as you have a developing animal form, there, there are points in that trajectory where, where it's important to differentiate one type of cell from another and for certain types of cells, muscle cells as opposed to nerve cells or, or uh, bone cells to, be, to start to be constructed. And all of this is, under, is closely choreographed by these signaling molecules. Uh, so you get a DNA that builds a regulatory RNA that turns on another part of the DNA that then turns on, uh, that, that builds a protein for servicing a particular type of cell at the right time and not at another time. And as Davidson and his colleagues mapped this out, they discovered that the functional relationships that were involved looked like an integrated circuit. It was, and, and they, they call them developmental gene regulatory networks. And the point is you can't build a completely uh, developed animal form unless you have this choreography taking place that is expressed through these developmental gene regulatory networks. But they discovered something else about them. And that is that they cannot be altered significantly. If you alter any of the core elements of these developmental gene regulatory networks, animal development shuts down. And this makes perfect sense to anyone with a background in, say, electrical engineering, because there's a principle of engineering that says the more tightly integrated a functional system, and the more difficult it is to perturb any part of the system without defect to the whole. It's a constraints principle. And this turned out to be true in spades of these effectively integrated circuits. Now, they weren't controlling the flow of, of um, electricity, but more the flow of information in, in the developing organism. So here's the, here's the argument. You need a developmental gene regulatory network to make an animal body plan. But if you want to turn one animal body plan into another animal body plan, you're going to have to change developmental gene regulatory network A into developmental, a, a completely novel developmental gene regulatory network to build that novel animal form. But the one thing we know experimentally is these things cannot be altered without the destruction of the first, uh, of the initial form. And once that form is destroyed, there's no more evolutionary development possible. Now, it turns out that not only neo-Darwinism, the kind of standard textbook form of evolutionary theory, has, has no answer for this. And Davidson was quite explicit about this. He was, by the way, no friend of creationism or intelligent design, but he said very explicitly that neo-Darwinism uh, commits a catastrophic error in thinking because it is not addressing this, this fundamental problem. There's no... Uh, um, but it's, and it's not just neo-Darwinism, really, there's, there's also newer models of, of evolutionary theory, and they don't address this either. This is, so, there, so there are these sort of fundamental challenges. Okay, so yeah, I mean, that was, that was pretty much the gist. Um, a lot of that was hard to understand for a layperson like myself. Uh, sounds like he's saying, hey, uh, you know, these gene regulatory networks, if I use that correctly, they do this one thing here, and then as soon as they do that, to do the next step, the gene regulatory network has to change completely for the next thing to happen, and that just like can't happen. Is that is that good, a good way to put it, or what did I mess up? So, so his, 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 his sorry, this echoes. sorry, this echoes. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, I'm not a developmental biologist at all. I, I look at bacteria, which luckily don't develop into this amazing complexity. Um, but all biologists, I guess, have, have some kind of training in this kind of area, and uh, it, it's really interesting. Um, the idea is that there's some genes that act early in the organism. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of one of the key ideas in, in kind of genes that are particularly involved in developing the organism. And his claim is that these genes are particularly hard to evolve um and it, it kind of makes an intuitive sense um you might think that um if there's this kind of gene network of genes that's really tightly integrated and it's involved in such a core process as development um 
the claim that he's making is that you, you can't change that without messing up development, the organism dies. Um, so in order to evolve, and, and development is how you get the different body plans. So different kind of kinds of animals have, have very different um, uh, kind of body structures. And so the question is, how do you how do you develop these different body structures where you have different developmental gene regulatory networks? And because these are so tightly integrated and they happen so early in development that they're, they're turned on, um, they can't really evolve. That's, you know, the kind of argument that he's making. Um, and yeah, so uh, there's a really nice essay on, on this topic that I, I think has the best answers on this question I really want to point people to. Um, uh, it's by a guy called Gregory Ray, uh, who's, um, I think at Duke university, uh, he's a Christian, uh, he's, he's written, um, for the website Biologos, an essay called new body plan emergence. And, um, exactly that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So it's, it's a really nice essay that, that goes through, um, specifically this claim that has made, been made by intelligent design, uh, people in, in, in a lot of detail. I just want to pull out a couple of things. Um, from that. So Stephen Meyer says, um, the one thing we know experimentally is these things cannot be altered without the destruction of the initial form. That's one of his, his key quotes. That's a, that's an empirical claim cannot be altered. I, I think he nuances that slightly. It cannot be altered much or something he goes on to say, but, um, it's just not true that they, they can't be altered. Um, Experimentally, that Greg Ray goes through in some detail that there are experiments where they have been altered and the, the organism was fine. Um, so that this is um, a bold claim that, that's made by Stephen Meyer, and it, it seems like it's, it's just not true. Um, I'm really surprised that he's still making this claim, given that Greg Ray wrote on Biologos, which is you know one of the main sites that's kind of opposing intelligent design. I'm sure Stephen Meyer and the Discovery Institute are aware of this article. So it's, for me, it's really surprising that they haven't responded to it and they're still making the claim. Um, so yeah, so uh, Greg Ray, for instance, gives, gives an example of, um, uh, disrupting one of these core, um, early acting genes and involved in key developmental gene, uh, regulatory network called a, a Hox gene. A specific hox gene is called uh, Antenopedia, and disrupting this gene in a spider results in a spider with 10 rather than the usual eight legs, and the spider's fine. It can uh, walk and feed and, and mate as, as normal. So this is this would be a direct counterexample to the kind of claim that Stephen Meyer is making, and, and Greg Ray goes through some of the literature on, the, on this kind of topic. Hmm. Um, I had a slide uh, with a quote from him as well that I think is is useful. Is it this one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the reality is that there exists no firm relationship between when a mutation acts in the life cycle and the extent of the damage it can cause. So Stephen Meyer was kind of saying that if it acts early, it's going to be lethal. That, but that's that's there's not this clear relationship actually, which you might think intuitively that there might, that there would be, but actually empirically it's, it's just not true because biology is more complicated than that. It's actually, it's not as tightly integrated as maybe claimed. It is quite modular in some ways. So you can actually switch things in and out. Um, so by the same token, the opportunity for a mutation to alter a trait in a way that might be adaptive is also not limited to late development. So you can have uh, mutations in genes that acting early and they can be adaptive or you can have mutations that are acting late in development they can be adaptive so th there's not the simple kind of um trade-off that that Stephen Meyer was suggesting um I, I think I had another uh okay yeah so that's that's the next topic so that's fine um no that's not it yeah no exactly <laughs> so yeah the, the main thing I want to say is if people really want to look into this I you know really recommend uh, reading Greg Ray's article. Um, he's a Christian. I think he's an evangelical Christian. He's a real leader in this field of um, the development, the evolution of these developmental uh, genes. Gotcha. The creative power 
of mutation and selection and other similar, similarly undirected uh, materialistic processes that have, are just not, have not been answered. And they seem pretty fundamental. Uh, what, what it looks like when you look at it, I've got a picture of both in two of my books, these networks, they look like circuits. And circuits in our experience are the product of engineers, of intelligence. I mean, we're, we're looking at distinctive hallmarks of intelligent agency when we look at it, circuitry and code and information processing systems. I mean, this is what we're finding inside life. It's not what Darwin thought in the 19th century or his colleagues, Huxley, who said the cell was a simple homogeneous globule of undifferentiated protoplasm. It's a new day in biology. Things are much more complex than people thought when they formulated these evolutionary ideas. There's a lot to... Okay, yeah. So nothing really new there. Uh, I mean, he he did... I um, mean, yeah, like, I guess it's your understanding that, sorry, it's your understanding that 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 is right. I mean, yeah, they have learned a lot, and it's a lot more complex. Um, but he seems like he's saying that he's that's an argument against evolution. Um, but he also said that there hasn't been responses, and then you show a response, and it doesn't seem like he's answered it. So maybe that's why he doesn't think there's responses to it. Or a good responses at all? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I wanted to say something else on that. Just sure. um, going going to, back to what we were talking about before about kind of the levels of evolution, like uh -huh. of evolution within the species or the genus or the family. Because um, I think this is another way to, to see that this point that he's making actually can't be right biologically. There's some as a biologist when I, when I hear these things and think about them carefully, I think there's just a disconnect here that um, these people aren't aren't thinking in the same way that basically all my biological colleagues are thinking. Um, so uh, Stephen Meyer and, and his, some of his colleagues will accept some level of common descent. So he says he accepts microevolution. That means he accepts evolution within some boundaries. Like, like I said before, it's not clear where those boundaries are, but um, if he's anything like uh, Answers in Genesis, then he's probably not as conservative as they are. But let's say he is as conservative as they are, then um, you can have evolution within the family level. Um, so, uh, for instance, a, a mouse and a rat would be related to each other. Um, someone like Ken Ham is actually less conservative than that, um, actually, in, in terms of bats. He thinks you can go up to the order level. And maybe some other mammals, he'd also go to the, the order level um, within his massively compressed time span. So this is this is a really conservative view. I'm... I'm Giving Steve Meyer the like this kind of the benefit of the doubt or the strongest case um, you could make. So this is just a nice chart just to illustrate these different levels, um, and the level that basically all creationists nowadays who are, have any kind of biological training will accept is at least the family level. They'll say, okay, evolution does work within the family level. <coughs> uh, in in most cases, they'll they'll have exceptions for that uh, as well, but. The point I want to make is that that's a lot of evolution. And if you look at these developmental gene regulatory networks, they also change within this level, within this um, kind of scope of evolution. It's not like these developmental gene regulatory networks stay completely unchanged within a family. That's the kind of thing that you might predict if you were Stephen Meyer, or if you are making these kind of argument, you might think, okay, these really there's some things that just really don't change at all because evolution doesn't work if you change them but it, it, that's just not true empirically that all these genes are changing some of them are changing more than others but they are changing i, I think i had another slide which um i think the next yeah exactly so so this slide is um just just an arbitrary uh, example i think it's from yeah i think it's from one of the papers that greg ray cites in his essay and i i just noticed um when looking at this, this is um, showing across different arthropods, um, so so things like uh, crabs and, and other things. Um, if you look carefully at, if, if you're a biologist and you look carefully at this uh, tree on the left, you'll see that some of these uh, species that are on this tree are actually related to each other within the same family. And what this kind of chart is showing is that they have different numbers of these different genes. And these genes are some of these key developmental genes, the kind of thing that Stephen Meyer was talking about. And so in other words, these things do change and they even change within the, the, the very small scale of evolution that someone like Ken Ham will accept. Um, does that argument make sense? That 
Stephen Meyer is making the claim that these things don't change. If you look empirically within, say, a family, which is presumably a level of evolution that Steve Meyer would accept, these things do change. Hmm. Um, so they, you can change them experimentally in the lab, and that's what Greg uh, Ray's uh, paper uh, essay was focused on. But they also change um, within my, what Steve Meyer would call microevolution. Hmm. Um, so, so that, mm. yeah, so that he can't use that as an argument against macroevolution if he accepts it actually does happen within the level of microevolution. Uh, so, I mean, obviously there's the whole gene regulatory network. So, I mean, I don't really even know what that is, if we're being honest. Maybe, he, is he just maybe defining it differently than in this example? Because... Um, no, I mean, he's he's based on, he's working on the assumption that he's been told that these things don't change experimentally. And there, there was some experimental reason to think that, and that some of these things were very hard to change experimentally. But more recently, it's, it's seen there's a bunch of counterexamples there, and they, there's a bunch of these that can be changed. Mm -hmm. So it, he's, he's making, I, I think, a similar move as, as was made before, from some small-scale experimental results to a broad-scale claim about mm -hmm. this can't happen. Mm -hmm. And that's just ripe for counterexamples. And sure enough, counterexamples come along, lots of them, to say this broad scale claim just doesn't work. So the original experimental uh, work was probably fine. And there are um, lots of things that are hard to change experimentally, but you can't make these broad scale change, uh, broad scale claims. Um, so the same was true for the, the protein structure stuff. You can't extrapolate to a general claim about all protein folds from some small scale experiments. You also can't extrapolate to general claims about the general nature about the evolution of uh, gene regulatory networks based on some kind of initial experimental results. Uh, so um, what, about, what about this Davidson guy? So that's the one who's citing it. He or Meyer is citing some guy named Davidson. Uh, I don't know if he specifically like gives an article or whatever, but uh, he says that Davidson's not a fan of like creationism or something like that. A, I guess he kind of implies that Davidson is an evolutionist. Do you know anything about yeah. him? Yeah, so so I, I'm really not in the in this field at all. So I <laughs> I should be I should be familiar with it, but I'm, I I've only kind of read a little bit on this kind of um, uh -huh. it's called Evo Devo or, or evolutionary development stuff. But um, there's a lot of people making kind of similar claims and saying that this um, a bunch of findings in this field give reason to question a very strict kind of neo-Darwinian view of evolution. But th th they, they don't say, therefore, evolution is wrong. It's still evolutionary biologists who are making these claims. They're just saying, no, this is evidence for a different view of evolution where there are, for instance, with, with Evo Devo, there are uh, structural constraints on how evolution works. There are biases in here. Um, it's not just natural selection that's doing all the work. There's also biophysical constraints that are important. Um, that's not an interesting claim for the kind of argument that Stephen Meyer is making. Like they're just orthogonal claims. They're just they're, they're just really not related. But uh, he's kind of being brought in as a as a useful witness in the case because he's saying um, neo Darwinian neo Darwinian evolution is bad. But that's not helping the broader case of opposing evolution in in general. Hmm. Uh, and and. In fact, people like Davison, I don't know exactly what his views were, but people in this field are proposing other mechanisms and, and, and other kind of evolutionary processes and factors that are important in evolution. So whatever view of um, the neo-Darwinian synthesis, which was before a lot of kind of modern molecular knowledge uh, came about. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Okay. All right. So what do we got next? Um are you good with your slides there? Um, yeah, I think I've basically said everything I want to say. Um, yeah, so just, just going back to this kind of taxonomic kind of picture, this kind of species, genus, family kind of classification. Um, Stephen Meyer said he believes in microevolution. It's not clear where that stops or what that means. 
But when you, as a biologist, look into that, and even if you take the very conservative view of something like Ken Ham, you see that means a lot of change, actually, mm -hmm. in the, at the sequence level. And that undercuts most of these anti-evolution arguments that they're making because they're saying, you know, this is, they're proposing, you know, this is the limit at the sequence level. Mm -hmm. But then if you compare the actual evolution that's happening within even the small evolution groups of a family, there's, that's extend, that's going beyond that supposed limit. Um, so there's, there's kind of a contradiction there and, and a, a problem. Um, there, there's also the, the big issue that there's a lot of evidence for common descent. There's a lot of stuff that fits the general pattern of common descent. Um, so when Stephen Meyer says he's skeptical of this, um, he's not really giving uh, good reasons. He, th he thinks he is because he thinks his argument against protein evolution and against a gene regulatory evolution uh, work, but but they don't actually match the empirical facts, um, I would say. So then you're left with kind of the, the big scale uh, patterns of common descent that still need to be explained. And some kind of evolutionary process is the best thing on the table to explain that. And that's why I um, find this um, framework really useful for my research. It's actually productive. I can kind of, um, I, I can make sense of the data with this framework. And someone like Stephen Meyer isn't actually giving me another alternative framework by which I could do my research. So as someone in my field, I, I don't see an alternative actually other than to try and develop evolutionary theory because um, that's the framework that seems to be fruitful uh, at the moment. And just for clarity, so basically you're saying, hey, you have, uh, you know, all this evidence on one side of the field here. And if you poke just small little holes in it, it doesn't mean that we have to destroy everything that all of the evidence we already have that we that that we have so much evidence that like it, it, it that just makes more sense to say that, like, hey, we just haven't explained that fully compared to saying that everything is wrong especially when all the other views for, you know, all that are just like not very good. Like, I mean, it, from like a, maybe a different perspective, it's like kind of how you had a Lamarckian evolution in the 1700s or 1800s. And, you know, that was maybe the popular view, but then they, they switched it up to Darwinism. And it's not like, you know, someone back then could have said, Hey, Lamarckianism is can doesn't explain everything. Therefore young with creationism, but you know they they learn more they they realized it had issues and they they moved on to uh, what they saw was better views yeah and um you know current evolutionary theory might not be true it could be radically different in the future that you know that, that's possible you know anything's possible science can change um but all the evidence so far is i think showing it's going to be some kind of evolutionary picture um so the rhetorical stances that people like Stephen Meyer are taking, I think is just unhelpful because it's biasing people against evolution as a whole. Hmm. Um, whereas actually the more interesting work from intelligent design people is kind of design merged with evolution in, in some way that, um, you know, design is coming in on top to fill some of the gaps of evolution or maybe it's shaping evolution in some way. Um, so, I, so I'm much more sympathetic to the latter, that there's some kind of design behind the evolutionary process. I'm very interested in that idea, but I, I don't see much hope in the kind of find some small problems with evolution and then demolish the whole thing. I don't think that's the way it's going. Um, I think whatever the future is, it's going to be some kind of evolutionary picture um, because that's where things have been at for the last couple of centuries. And I think the evidence is only getting stronger in a bunch of ways for this kind of unfolding of life. Um, over deep time, uh, which is the evolutionary process. Yeah, no, that's really interesting because you are, uh, you've, you've spoken publicly about how you think there's actually a lot of evidence for God by evolution. Like evolu evolution gives us good reason to think God exists. And, um, you know, just something, something that hit me was like, even if my area is to say like, hey, there's specific problems here, here, and here, in reality, I mean, some, all we have to do is just say, hey, God did it. And then we could also say that God used evolution everywhere else where we already do have evidence. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly how po poking holes in something like that would would therefore make us say we should throw out the whole thing. Like that doesn't disqualify all the rest of 
you know, whatever you call evidence. I'm not an expert. Um, I'm just speaking for other scientists. Yeah. And so Stephen Meyer might be open to that and, and others who are intelligent and friendly would be open to that, that there's kind of a general evolutionary process and then there's some kind of interventions in that. Um, but I have a problem with the whole rhetorical stance where evolution is seen as the bad thing yeah. and the thing that you're skeptical of. Uh, whereas in reality, this, there's so much evidence that at least needs to be dealt with. And yeah, so I, I have a problem with kind of the attempt to undermine evolution. And they might say, oh, this thing that you're talking about where it's kind of designed, that's not evolution. I, I think that's disingenuous. I, I think, you know, there are a lot of people who are theistic evolutionists. They have all kinds of views about how design might be involved in evolution. You can't just say, um, you can't just call that intelligent design whilst at the same time, all of the rhetoric is like strongly anti-evolution um, and, and kind of using creationist arguments. So yeah, I, I don't think it works. Like I, I think the scientifically most fruitful way is to really engage with the evidence for some kind of evolution and try and build it into your picture, whatever that is, mm -hmm. rather than trying to undermine the, the whole thing. Yeah, no, there's, and there's actually, you know, there's actually young earth creationists out there that do do that. Uh, you know, maybe not on the level of yourself, but, you know, um, someone like Todd Wood or Marcus Ross, like they're, they're more willing to, to, to push the line a little bit further and still, they're still young earth creationists. They, they still try to figure it out how to get to work. And they're willing to say, Hey, you know, like Todd Wood said, Hey, like there's evidence for evolution. I just think there's more evidence for young earth creationism. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, if, if that's where the evidence leads, um, and I, I do appreciate that, um, but I'm totally I'm totally sympathetic to what you're saying too, though. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's. Um, you, you've got some like fact checking Rogan is, is what you have in the notes here. Um, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of getting off the science, but I, I thought you know um, I've been very friendly to, to Joe Rogan at the at the moment. Maybe not as friendly to Stephen <laughs> Meyer as, as I should have been, but I, yeah. but by doing that, I'm not. I, I don't actually, I'm not very sympathetic to a lot of stuff that, that Joe Rogan's uh, keen on. Mm -hmm. That's kind of off topic, so we don't need to talk about it, but just wanted to flag <laughs> that. Uh, but he also says some crazy stuff in this interview that yeah. since, since we're talking about this interview, we shouldn't let him off the hook for, for that stuff. Yeah, it's really um, interesting though, because he, I, I honestly, maybe I'm a bad person for doing this. I assumed it would be a lot worse. I assumed like, you know, Rogan to say stuff like claims aren't evidence and you know, the Bible is just a bunch of claims and, you know, go dilly hunty or something. But no, you know, Rogan asks some interesting questions, but he also asks some really weird ones. So let's let's get into that. Uh, the only people that can do science once it gets going are people who, of religious faith. But it is to say that the people with a particular religious faith had a reason to pursue science that apparently uh, other cultures did not have to the same degree. Do we know that for a fact, though? Because there, there's a lot of evidence that we've lost some civilizations. We've lost a lot of their knowledge, the burning of the Library of Alexandria. We, we don't really know that much about what they knew. Obviously, they had some incredibly complex mathematics if they built the pyramids. We know that. We, we know there had to be measurement. We know there had to be like some very complex geometry in order for them to figure out how to do it correctly. Well, certainly, there may have been other things. So this is, yes, yes. This is so fun. Yeah, on that, I just wanted to highlight the, the Library of Alexandria that he kind of just casually chucked in there, um, which which I would say is just a straightforwardly a kind of standard kind of secular myth. Um, uh, do, you, do you have any comments on that? Uh, have, have you, is this something you hear that much? Uh, um, just from like athe internet atheism. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I know that I haven't even read this quote here, but um, yeah, it's my understanding that it's like a myth. Like, you know, we had all kinds of other texts back then. Uh, the, the the Library of Alexandria really wasn't that great. Like it had some, you know, books, obviously, stuff like that in it, but we didn't really lose that much from it. Yeah, so the stronger version of the myth that he doesn't actually make is that, you know, Christians burned it. And maybe he's kind of implicitly referring to that. But even just the, the, the idea that it was burned and we lost lots of stuff. Uh, you can just go to Wikipedia like I did and and just check that out. And it, I, I think it's a pretty good um, summary of the the actual history there, which is that there was this kind of gradual 
uh, loss of some kind of of the the library, but it wasn't this burning um, that destroyed everything, which is kind of what Rogan seems to be referring to, um, which just kind of reminded me that he's he's just going on kind of stuff that he's heard somewhere yeah. that that sounds legit and that kind of gets built into his worldview as as yeah. kind of clear and obvious fact that he can pr bring out as to to oppose this apologist that he has on so it's, it's just interesting for me that he he brings this out as just an obvious fact when it's actually just an obvious myth um <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no no citation um but uh I, that is a really interesting quote it says it is unclear how much was actually destroyed and it seems to have either survived or even been rebuilt shortly thereafter so yeah, maybe we didn't even lose that much in the actual library at all. That's really yeah, yeah. I think it's it's, it's not that clear. Um, so yeah, here's another claim that would be fun to go to about some um, translation of the Bible. Yeah. Um, oh, before that, uh, he mentions yeah. the pyramids. So the pyramids is a really fun topic because he's, you know, all into this like. I, I don't know if what he actually believes, but you know, he t he talks about like ancient aliens building the pyramids and stuff like that, and. Um, all this like, oh my gosh, you know, it, there's no way we can explain it. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, he's saying like, we lost this incredible knowledge, but the, the the way the pyramids were built, like we, every Egyptologist, like actual Egyptologist, there's no actual Egyptologist that won't say like, hey, we have a general idea of how they built it. Maybe not the exact specific. And, and I know that the numbers are, uh, taken out of context and not actually as crazy as maybe he implies, but they, they certainly were very intelligent and had really good ways of doing things, but it's not like impossible. Only aliens could have done it kind of stuff. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's really interesting that he's, he's really skeptical about some, I mean, you know, maybe everyone's like this, but very selectively skeptical. He, he's, he's, he's skeptical of some of the stuff Stephen Meyer is saying, but at the same time, he's saying this completely yeah. uh, crazy stuff that's yeah. pretty way out there. And he's just saying it as a kind of obvious fact. Right, right, um, right, exactly. It, so it's, it's it's just kind of funny to watch, um, I would say. All right. So we're skipping a lot. Uh, Meyer went through a lot of philosophy and the problem of evil and stuff like that. So... Let's let's see what else they have to say here. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I can't hear that. From this That's divine right. inspiration. But how do we know? When something's written down and also we're we're translating it, right? We're translating it from you know Aramaic, from ancient Hebrew, and it goes into Latin and Greek, and there's a lot <laughs> going on there, and yeah. then eventually to English, and there's a lot of room for interpretation. Um, let me give it general. So basically, he's saying like what we can't know uh, what the the biblical text was because there's a lot of translation and interpretation is that a gist that you got from that yeah yeah i'm sorry, sorry this is it. oh we're good yes i mean what what's your take on that from from the kind of was that the historically was that the uh, transmission from aramaic to hebrew to oh. latin to greek to, to eventually oh, okay. to english was that um as, as, as a scientist i i've no idea about that but was was that the historical uh, pathway um yeah when i first listened to that maybe i was being too nice um people can rewatch if they really want to um i did not interpret it that way but maybe that's me being extra um uh generous i don't know but no i mean you have the the old testament which is like 99 percent hebrew then you have new testament which is greek and then you have a little bit of Aramaic sprinkled in the Old Testament here and there. But, I mean, for the most part, and also in the New Testament a little bit. But, yeah, no, like, there's definitely not from Aramaic to Hebrew. Um, now, I mean, there was uh, certainly, depending on when you think the, the Old Testament was written, so that's interesting because you have, like, you know, Proto-Hebrew, and, like, if the, the, the Hebrew that we have today, if... Moses actually did write the, the you know, 
the, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, you do have this, um, you know, what they, what if Moses read it, what you know, much, most Christians do think, most scholars, I don't have an answer to that one, but most Christians think that, and if that is true, what Moses wrote down was certainly not what we have today, and uh, very, very different language. Um, so that's a fun topic in itself. But no, I wouldn't say it was written from Hebrew to Aramaic or Aramaic to Hebrew. That's interesting. Um, I mean, I, I probably was being a bit mean there, but <laughs> the, the, the main thing I wanted to point out, like he says, and then eventually to English. Um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty, and he says from, you know, from to Latin to like Latin's not relevant, right? Obviously to, yeah. to the question that we have Greek manuscripts, we have Hebrew manuscripts. Right. Latin is not relevant. Aramaic is not that relevant unless you're, is it just Daniel has, or, or something has a little bit of Aramaic? Mostly Daniel, yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. So, but the way he presents it makes it this kind of standard kind of skeptical claim that there was this kind of train, a uh, chain of transmission, which has so many links, you can never know what, what happened when actually we have, you know, for the New Testament, at least we have pretty early manuscripts right. um, in the original language and, and you know geographically dispersed we can we can have pretty good confidence what what the original said yeah and bart our, bart Ehrman gets a lot of hate you know being an atheist new testament scholar um you know the the whole telephone game and stuff like that but uh even when you ask him he's done presentations where he's like actually been defending like the new testament from what we have like hey yeah this is probably what they had and we can be pretty confident about almost all of it um but uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously all the nonsense about like, hey, you know, it's translation, it's interpretation, we can't know. Uh, but you know, that's what obviously scholarship is for and uh, why we have experts that spend their entire lives learning that and, and communicate. And it's not like just a guessing game, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. Sometimes like I hear, there, there might be a word here or there. It's like, I don't know, it could be a number of different, different things, but yeah. Um, nothing to worry about i'd say in any way all right uh yeah so a couple of things else um he mentioned yeah uh like a bunch of mushroom talk i i don't really have much to say um uh, allegra the scholar what is that 249.25 uh, so it was Christian belief based on uh, psychedelic mushrooms? Is that the official um, scholarly consensus on that topic? Yeah, yeah, definitely not. Um, the The idea of this like a mushroom thing from Allegra, I, I want to listen to it again, just just so people can see or hear what he actually said. The John Marco Allegro, who was that? Other I, than that? I, I, well, I have a, I have a, I have a of God I've had in the sort of saying about personal experience before right. it's not dispositive of these big dis these big discussions are you aware of John Marco Allegro no the John Marco Allegro who was a uh, a scholar a uh, biblical scholar and he was also an ordained minister who became agnostic when he started studying theology he was one of the people that deciphered the Dead Sea Scrolls and he worked with it over a period of uh, 14 years deciphering it and it's very controversial but his interpretation of Christianity after reading these scrolls was that it was initially about psychedelic mushroom rituals and fertility rituals and that this was what they were documenting in these ancient scrolls and that what he believed is that these psychedelic mushrooms were what we thought of as mana or the host that the, the body of Christ that these these experiences were directly attributed to people taking these psychedelic mushrooms in these these rituals and many people who have had psychedelic experiences especially on psilocybin and on other like very potent psychedelic drugs. Is that the acting agent within uh, mushrooms that creates the psychedelic? That's, that's in one type of mushroom. Okay. The one that John Marco Allegro uh, alleges is a little bit more complex. It's called the Amanita muscaria, and it's more, more complex in that uh, the belief is that it is 
seasonably variable, genetically variable, and then it must be uh, cultivated in a specific way. And many people who have tried to achieve these states with uh, Amanita muscaria have failed where others have succeeded. And it's because of obviously because it's illegal and frowned upon. It's, it's very complex. You know, John Hopkins has done, uh, they've done a lot of work. Okay, so that that was a really interesting comment. The, the funny thing for me is Meyer, you know, Stephen Meyer, you know, he's like Christian. Uh, I mean, I guess you could say he's a scientist or philosopher or whatever. You know, he's not like a biblical studies guy. Honestly, I'd be surprised if he even heard of Allegro or Allegro, whatever the guy's name is. Um, but uh, it's really interesting to me to hear Meyer's response because like he's almost like this old guy is boomer the word. I don't know. Like, like I, I, I'm an old person. I don't know about mushrooms. What? <laughs> um, and of course, Rogan. You know, I guess that's his theory for like how Christianity arose, um, which just has like almost next to zero evidence for, and every scholar on the planet in Allegra's time rejected it as well as today. Um, there's just like almost no evidence for it, and I mean, all you have to do is pull up Wikipedia, and it has 15 arguments against the idea. Um, it's yeah, it's just really interesting to to listen to how into it Joe Rogan is. Yeah, he, he's really into it, and he kind of makes it sound a little bit sciency. He he kind of uses some sciency words, and um, and just how seriously he takes it. It's it's um, yeah, it, it's a different world, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny because they're probably like he's probably pretty smart about like the whole mushrooms thing and like the different kinds and what they do and all that. And like maybe not like an expert scientist or anything like that. But, you know, he, he probably has a pretty good idea. Um, but then like when you talk about like, you know, historical stuff, like he's he's all over the place. Uh, OK, um, yeah. So you had a couple things here. Um, I don't necessarily see a reason to to, to look at the actual quotes. Uh, you talk yeah, about no, that, I, I, yeah. I, I just found it curious, just a couple of things I, I wanted to flag back on Stephen Meyer. Uh -huh. um, and people might think I'm being mean here, maybe I am. Um, but I just think facts are really important. It's just interesting when people make, just get kind of simple, verifiable, easy, easy to check facts wrong. It could just be a slip. Uh, a mental slip that that happens, but it, it's just interesting when the slip happens in in a certain way that kind of makes the story sound better. Mm. Um, so I, I just wanted to flag that it's really important for apologists and to 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 get this stuff right. And if I make these kind of slips, I, I hope people point them out because I don't want to repeat it in in future. Um, so for instance, um, a couple that stood out to me when I was listening, I thought that that's not right. Um, around one hour and sixteen minutes. Um, Maya says that uh, John Polkinghorne, famous uh, Christian physicist, had a late in life religious conversion uh, due to evidence, basically, at least partly due to evidence from fine tuning. And that's just not true as far as I can tell. He was a Christian as a student, he was involved in the Christian Union. What he did have late in life was he became a priest, and that's quite famous. So it's, it's just surprising to me that Maya would kind of, I would say, exaggerate the story so that he has a religious conversion due to the fine tuning argument which is just just not what what happened some some other people have had that um some other people some other scientists and such have have become christians of course right. late in life and you could point to those maybe he's mixing two stories together or something but it was just <laughs> yeah. it, it was just um interesting that that happened um also just a, a more, more minor one around an hour and 50 minutes uh, in the interview he says that he had a debate with peter atkins on the bbc which is a in the UK, that's like a really prestigious thing. Uh, that would be like you're on national news. It would be quite a big thing. But it, his debate wasn't on the BBC. It was on a Christian radio show called the Premier Christian Radio. Which and maybe awesome. it seems really, yeah, which is awesome. And I also had a debate <laughs> with Peter Atkins on on Premier Radio. But it, it's not the BBC. It's like saying, you know, I was written about in the New York Times when it, actually it was a local paper. Uh, it, um, Maybe it doesn't matter, but it's just these are the kind of things like you you got to get these these facts right, I think, and it's just important um, for people listening. I, th I think to to on both sides, like 
just to point out, Rogan is getting some facts wrong. Stephen Meyer, unfortunately, is also getting some of these facts wrong. And um, this is why peer review and that kind of thing is just super important, that we've got to hold each other to a higher standard. I think that's true for apologists, for atheists, whatever. Um, we can't we, we can't just have these kind of public spokespeople and whatever they say we just accept is is true because then we repeat the stories that they tell and it just the exaggeration kind of continues from from um, down the chain and a lot of the stuff is really easy to check and whether it's the the mushroom stuff or the details of Polkinghorne's life they're both on Wikipedia you can check that stuff quickly mm. and I just want to encourage people to, to do that um, also the, the science stuff as well like don't you know, this stuff is actually not that complicated, necessarily. You can check a lot of the stuff yourself without being an expert. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, but you know. also do agree with Meyer on a lot of the, you know, arguments, arguments you made or you yeah. think there's intelligibility, intelligibility of the universe? Yeah. Um, sorry, we just got a flag saying recording error. Uh, I don't see it. We're, oh, okay. We should be okay. Okay, sorry, rewind that. You're good. Um, but no, I was just saying that, like, yeah, you do agree with a lot of what he did say, though. So there's a lot of stuff you did agree with and you thought was great. Um, and people can go watch that and enjoy it. Um, but then, you know, throw in a little bit of your commentary in there too. see, see if it stacks up with the evidence. Yeah, yeah. So that's definitely the last thing I want to say that um, I think Stephen Meyer did really well in preparing for the interview and the way he approached it. I, I think there's lots to learn there in terms of just the way he interacted with Joe yeah, Rogan. That was really cool to see. Um, and that a lot of the stuff he said was kind of like, I think it would connect with Joe and his audience. And I hope some of that audience is, is listening now and, and keen to kind of dig into some of those details because there's lots of stuff he said. Um, philosophically, I basically agree with most of what um, Stephen Meyer was saying that you know, there is intelligibility to the universe. There's a rational mind behind it. That makes sense of why we can do science, that 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 gives a framework for science. And um, I just want to extend that further and, and not be so critical about um, biological evolutionary science as, as well. I think we can also approach that with a more kind of positive disposition. Hmm. And that's what I encourage our Christians to do. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah, very, very good stuff. Okay. Appreciate you coming on here. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I hope people got some out of this. Put your comments if you disagree or you agree or whatever. Uh, tell Dr. Arden why he's wrong and um, prove him wrong. Yeah, fact check me. That would be great. Yeah, there you go. Cool. All right. And um, yep, you can uh, go check out me my uh, my talk with Dr. Arden. Um, I mean, you want to plug in your little podcast? <laughs> Um, that's good. We we had a chat a while ago about um, science, I think. Yeah. The science, and you think? <laughs> I was thinking yeah. of the podcast where you did with uh, Dr. Collins. Uh, not sure which one you're talking about. Uh, not, not which one? Oh, okay. That's oh, Atkins. Right. No, not Atkins. Uh, on, like a podcast. Oh podcast. yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so um, oh yeah, that's sorry. Um, I interviewed um, uh. <laughs> C. John Collins or, or Jack Collins on, on Genesis. Is that the one that you're yes, thinking about? Yes. Okay. Was, yeah. Yeah. People go check out that too. If you want to hear uh, Dr. Arden's great voice. <laughs> um, great. All right. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this and it's been fun.